A city cursed to bring about the living dead. A hotel sitting atop a portal to the beyond. And a house by a cemetery. These are the gates of hell, and they'll never be shut again. After spending decades hopping across genres including comedies, westerns, and giallo, Lucio Fulci broke through to worldwide recognition with 1979's Zombie 2, capitalizing on the international success of George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead, with a zombie story that straddled the line between the modern undead infection and the classic voodoo spell. Now climbing the ranks in horror, Fulci capitalized on the opportunity with a fast return to zombies that was far harder to categorize than his previous tropical island set terror. In 1980 and 1981, Fulci directed five feature films, three of which comprise what has come to be known as the Gates of Hell trilogy. These neo-gothic horror movies, City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, and The House by the Cemetery, came to define Fulci and so much of Italian horror of the time. Since then, they've continued to influence horror, not just on film, but in video games and TV. At the time of their debut, each was met with ravenous love from horror fans and disgust by critics, thanks to their borderline nonsensical plots and boundary-pushing gore. But what makes these three thematically connected cult classics into undying pillars of horror? Let's open the gates and find out what lies beyond. Guess what? It's All Saints Day. A demanding, implacable enemy whose search for blood is never satiated. City of the Living Dead was released in Italy on August 11th, 1980, and was co-written by Fulci and Dardano Sacchetti. Like all three of these films, cinematography was done by Sergio Salvati and editing by Vincenzo Tomasi. The story follows psychic Mary Woodhouse, played by Catriona McCall, who stars in all three of the Gates films, and a small group of people drawn to a mystery in the small American town of Dunwich, where a priest named Father Thomas has committed suicide in an effort to open the gates of hell on All Saints Day. And as the day draws closer, the dead begin to walk the earth. But will our group of survivors be able to stop the horror, or is it already too late? And listen, I'm not much for detailing the plots of movies in my videos, or really in the videos I watch. Don't watch videos instead of experiencing stories, actually experience the stories. But summarizing the plots of Fulci movies is absolutely pointless. I consider each of these films to be equal parts neo-gothic haunted house stories and modern gore fests as committed to spooking the audience with creeping, fog-filled vistas that hint at the world beyond ours, as putting nasty effects on screen with as few cutaways as possible. But each movie is indebted to previous works on both page and screen, filtering classical horror through a modern, blood-splattered Italian lens. City setting in the town of Dunwich, Massachusetts makes a very clear connection to H.P. Lovecraft's short The Dunwich Horror a story about a creature summoned and raised in secret through dark rituals before being unleashed, and the small group of people who raced to stop it. Fulci let it be clearly known that he was a Lovecraft fan, and was specifically trying to capture the author's style. Every horror film confronts viewers with some type of real-life fear, and death is always present to some degree, either as the fear in question or its expression. Death itself is the central fear here, the inevitability of death and how that dictates how we live. With each entry, the closeness of death to our characters changes, as well as how it ultimately affects them. In City of the Living Dead, the town of Dunwich exists on the precipice of the afterlife, and the characters are ultimately trying to beat back death, even if it is inevitable. The town mortuary is a major location, but not as the cause of the evil. Like Don Coscarelli's Phantasm, its characters must come face to face with the starkness of dead bodies before they rise as something worse. Each of the Gates films also features at least one child, and with each entry, the child moves closer to the center of the story. Here it's John John, whose entire family is ultimately killed by the undead and is tormented by the horrible things happening all around him. The scene where John John calls to say that his sister's corpse killed his parents is one of the scariest moments of the film. All we see is a shocked John holding the phone and blood dripping from the ceiling. 
For all of Fulci's love of viscera, gore, and effects in close-up, he's very good at horror by suggestion. Ultimately, John John is the final arbiter of doom, and the sign that death has not been beaten. How? I don't know. This ending makes no sense. I don't think I need to explain how horror is scarier when it's mysterious. Fear of the unknown plays on the imagination much more than when it's fully defined. And this is taken to its extreme in Fulci's movies. Not only are the reasons for the horror never fully understood, but the logic, structure, and narrative of these movies are often completely opaque. I see it as both a weakness and a strength. And I think how much it's seen as one or the other really depends on each movie as well as the viewer. The tropes used here are very classical in nature. Foggy nights, cemeteries, ghouls as the basis for the living dead, psychic visions. It's a story of the boundary between the living and the dead blurring, and the horror being our awareness of the inevitability of the grave and it's all presented in a skewed manner. There are some truly nonsensical cutaway scenes, like the guy with the blow-up doll and a bunch of worms. It's zombies abide by no rules, underlit to create a strange paleness as more ghosts than flesh eater. The classic Italian ADR creates a disconnect from the performances. I would find such an unusual paradox of tremendous appeal terribly stimulating. Danger is always lurking. When McCall's psychic character wakes up in a coffin about to be buried, she's saved by a pickaxe that barely misses her head several times. In Fulci's movies, not even a heroic rescue can be free from strange horrors. The scares of City range from very simple jump cuts that cause monsters to appear in frame, to disgusting disgusting practical effects that fill the screen with blood and guts. One victim throwing up all her organs is a great gag that splits between the actress herself and a dummy, coming together for something disgusting. The drill kill is absolutely horrendous and is honestly still shocking thanks to the effects on display. The signature kill of the movie is what I like to call the brain grab. It's like the Von Erich's iron claw but from behind and just a little bit stronger. Also, I absolutely have to mention that Fabio Fritzi's score is too dang good. It's like I'm hiding out from the apocalypse in the coolest club on Earth. City has a bit of a slow start compared to the other two movies of the trilogy. It's sort of teasing out the mystery of what's happening before the stakes are established, and then the horror fully explodes. Personally, what I really like about City is its balance between gothic atmosphere and boundary-pushing gore never really sacrificing one for the other, and ramping up its scares as its zombies invade Dunwich, and take a dark sort of revenge on its citizens. Horror is not a goal in itself to me, said Fulci. I am basically interested in the fantastic. As a matter of fact, there are few horror scenes in City of the Living Dead. Tension is the most important thing in this film. I have given up on horror for horror's sake. Instead, I want to make a nightmare film where horror is ubiquitous, even in apparently innocuous forms. City, to me, is a visual rendering of the metaphysical side of bad dreams. I'd like to point out that the audience usually applauds once a horror scene is over, not while the horror is happening on the screen. People are wrong when they accuse my films of gratuitous horror. Censorship is wrong about my films being an incentive to violence. Far from participating in this violence, the spectator, on the contrary, is rid of it, freed from horrors he holds within himself, the film being the catalyst for this liberation. My films are only nightmares, after which you wake up relieved and relaxed, and fantastic films are liberating, especially for the youth, because of this role of the audience. With its solid performance at the Italian box office, Fulci quickly went on to make the Edgar Allan Poe-inspired The Black Cat, before returning to the gates with The Beyond. Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell, because through that gateway, evil will invade the world. The Beyond was released in Italy on April 29th, 1981 this time co-written by Fulci with Sacchetti and Giorgio Mariuzzo. Here, our focus is a cursed hotel in New Orleans, built on top of a hellgate by a warlock named Schweik, which has been inherited by Liza Merrill, played by McCall. But her encounter with blind psychic Emily and a series of murders pushes her to investigate the true nature of the hotel, which slowly unleashes the damned upon the world. Here, the Beyond pulls its influences from Clark Ashton Smith, whose invention, The Book of Ibon, 
is at the center of the evil rituals here. Smith was a contemporary of Lovecraft and had many of his stories published in Weird Tales. But one of the major strengths of The Beyond is that it has far fewer touchstones than the other parts of this trilogy. Instead, The Beyond is pure rumination on the inevitability of death, the fear of what lies beyond, and powerlessness in the face of evil. Narrative coherence was never one of Fulci's strong suits as a director. The way his scenes hang together and the ways in which his scripts provide information to audiences often have something lacking. So why not make movies where a lack of coherence is part of the story? Terrors beyond your imagination mean that you will never fully be able to understand how or why something is happening. And that's definitely the underlying idea of The Beyond. I've always found that when a creator says that their story operates on dream logic, it's shorthand for saying, I couldn't get my script to make sense. And well, not every movie needs to make perfect sense to be good. In the end, I think the most important thing for a movie to do is to keep its audience fully engaged. That mostly means entertained, but it can also mean scared, sad, or moved, whatever the movie is intending to do. In that way, all movies are like dreams engulfing audiences into their stories and never letting them go until the credits roll. It's only then that audiences can realize that elements didn't make sense or that the filmmaking techniques were lacking in some way. The absolute worst thing a movie can do is to be boring. The Beyond is absolutely not boring. Supposedly, the plot was formed around the death sequences that Fulci wanted to film, with the movie's standout effects dictating the story around it. And there was no official shooting script, with scenes and ideas thought of by Fulci during filming. The result is that The Beyond is a movie that makes up for its lack of narrative cohesion with a great sense of immediacy and imagination balancing neo-gothic moodiness with gross-out gags. This time, Fulci is most interested in eye-based horror. Eyes gouged out, blind people with really weird contacts, more eyes gouged out. It seems as if our encounters with evil are simply too much for humans to take, with blindness being the only option for these unfortunate souls. In relation to death, the truth of the beyond is that we are, in essence, already beyond death. The gate to hell is open and all its horrors have been unleashed. Which is why there's little plot beyond our characters trying to understand what's happening. And its setting of New Orleans, with the film largely shot on location, is perfect for this story of the occult and the omnipresence of death. The child this time is young Jill, who loses both of her parents and ultimately succumbs to the evil, as seen in her onset of blindness. She's soon one of the undead horde. No hope for salvation. Once again, Fulci employs the use of two extremes in his approach to horror. There's the sudden shock of supernatural beings popping into frame for your standard jump scares, and there's the slow, inevitable creep of something terrible. The blood-laced acid pool in the mortuary and, in its most sustained set piece, a slow march of tarantulas over an incapacitated victim. Jill seeing her mother's head get dissolved by acid, done by making a mold of the actress's head and using real acid. My eyes, the goggles do nothing. Ah. Is some next level dang ass freak gorehound shit. But at the same time, Fulci's focus on effects and style over actual emotion means that it's very easy to enjoy these moments as horror entertainment instead of something truly disturbing. The march of the tarantulas goes on for so long that it's almost a mini-movie in itself, full of close-up bites and blood that, if not for the very clearly fake spiders and head mold, would freak me out. Trust me, I hate spiders. But this scene is more stylistically interesting than actually disturbing. And again, one of the most effective moments in the film is one of its most low-key, with blind Emily groping through a room filled with the undead. Once again, Fritzi's score is an absolute highlight, filled with foreboding voices, soaring strings, and a swelling orchestra that feels like the world's most groovy funeral. It's perfect. Compared to City's more coherent stakes, The Beyond maintains its mystery throughout, and its characters are flies caught in the web. Right from the start, there's a foreboding sense of doom. Everything seems cursed, and once again, both the causes of the horror and the ways in which characters react are borderline nonsensical. My dude has a really hard time shooting these zombies in the brain, but the second the little girl touches our lead, he has no problem blowing her head clean off. 
what makes Fulci's brand of horror, and the Gates of Hell movies in particular, so unique is that they exist as truly strange objects. It's impossible to classify them in any one subgenre. Zombie? Supernatural? Slasher? Mystery? Yes, all of the above. And the way they're structured and motivated, with little explanation or logic ever fully given to what we're watching, often throws viewers for a loop. Either hold these movies at a distance to observe as unique visions, or fully embrace them as personal nightmares. But if you refuse to let them sweep you away into their dark visions, they only become frustrating. My idea was to make an absolute film, with all the horrors of our world, said Fulci. It's a plotless film, a house, people, and dead men coming from the beyond. There's no logic to it, just a succession of images. The Sea of Darkness, for instance, is an absolute world, an immobile world where every horizon is similar. I think each man chooses his own inner hell, corresponding to his hidden vices. So I am not afraid of hell, since hell is already in us. Curiously enough, I can't imagine a paradise exists, even though I am a Catholic. But perhaps God has left me. Yet I have often envisaged hell, since we live in a society where only hell can be perceived. Finally, I realize that paradise is indescribable. Imagination is much stronger when it is pressed by the terrors of hell. It is true that all my films are terribly pessimistic. The main characters in the beyond, for instance, become blind as their sight has no raison d'etre anymore in this lifeless world. Once again, the Beyond would perform all right upon release in Italy, enough for Fulci to move forward with his trilogy capper. The final entry in the trilogy, The House by the Cemetery, was released in Italy on August 14, 1981, with Fulci, Sacchetti, and Mariuzzo once again co-writing the movie. This time, a small family consisting of Lucy, played by McCall, her husband Norman, and their son Bob move into the old home of Dr. Freudstein, which has played host to a history of death and mystery. As each family member comes to learn more about their new home, horrifying secrets are revealed, and the fight to escape begins. In regards to this entry's inspirations, there are some very clear parallels with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, with the dead body legacy of a certain Dr. Freudstein making the illusions pretty obvious, as well as H.P. Lovecraft's Reanimator. Sacchetti said that he also took inspiration from Henry James's The Turn of the Screw, and its ambiguous haunting with children at the center. Fulci also described the film as his answer to Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of The Shining, and the use of a haunted house that seems to have a history of driving its occupants insane, a young blonde boy tormented at the center, and psychic visions are all there. But Fulci also described Kubrick's movie as not being dark enough, which, like, damn dude. I wouldn't say that House by the Cemetery is as good as The Shining at being constantly, truly unsettling, but it's got great atmosphere and, of course, ups the gore by about 500%. And by the end, Fulci's film is absolutely darker, or at least more hopeless than how The Shining concludes. Thanks to Fulci's giallo background, House has the most in common with the slasher subgenre, narrowing its focus down to one mysterious killer, and even placing us in their shoes for bloody deaths. Much like how the early slashers of the time that borrowed heavily from the giallo subgenre. This also means that House is smaller in focus, more grounded, and less ambitious than the other two parts of the trilogy. It also means that the absurd clashes harder with the film's narrative. Why does the nanny clean up blood from the previous night's kill? Why was the father seemingly spotted in the town months earlier? It's now impossible to completely dismiss these due to the supernatural largely lacking in this story, and their strangeness reinforced American critics' view of Fulci as a poor storyteller. And I can't completely dismiss the shortcomings of House or any of these movies when it comes to narrative cohesion. But what I can tell you is that they are dead set on horrifying their audience. With each film, that becomes more and more of the priority. Each successive movie in the trilogy seems to adopt more and more shorthand, slipping further into horror movie tropes in media res, and cutting out more exposition and setup with each entry. City has a large amount of setup for its supernatural threats, with most of the first half anticipating the gates of hell being opened. The Beyond has the demonic invasion in full swing after its sepia tone prologue and House begins with the end of a slasher movie.
This time, our child is the center of the film, and Bob, really calling a kid Bob, has a loss of innocence directly tied to his parents' marriage falling apart, and the omnipresence of death disrupting his young life. We're now at the start of what should be a long life that is threatened to be cut short and tainted. Compared to the other two entries, House by the Cemetery is the least discussed of the trilogy. Another element that sets it apart is that there is no actual gate to hell present in this entry. But really, this loose trilogy is connected through thematic, production, and stylistic elements, and not actual narrative. The metaphorical gate to hell is Freudstein's rejection of death turning himself into a walking corpse kept alive by body parts from his victims. And his ultimate attack on Bob's parents is like a personal gate opened in the life of the young boy. It's the closing set piece that is easily the highlight of House, unleashing the secrets and gore we've been anticipating. Unfortunately, I find the rest of the film to be so much weaker than the other two entries of the trilogy. The effects are still good, and the score, this time by Walter Rizat, is a great gothic organ-propelled ephemeral lament. But its family drama is uninteresting, and with little to cover its threadbare plot, the holes in narrative and logic stand out as flaws instead of features this time. All three Gates films end on a dark note, and show that Fulci's intentions were not to tell cathartic tales that help audiences face and overcome fears, but instead to fully unsettle viewers. Unfortunately, I think two of these are their film's weakest parts. City uses a classic rug pull, having its heroes seemingly stop the apocalypse, only for their hopes to be shattered. How? Um, I have no idea. The film simply ends with young John John running toward our protagonists, an off-camera scream, and the freeze frame cracking into black. <laughs> Complete nonsense, apparently due to Fulci not liking the original filmed ending. The Beyond is easily the strongest ending, as our heroes fight back the undead, only to suddenly find themselves within the painting of hell seen at the start, going blind and lost in the underworld, as the ominous voiceover fulfills the film's prophecy. It's absolutely chilling. Finally, House ends with our two parents killed by the unstoppable Freudstein, as Bob is pulled to safety, only to now seemingly be in the afterlife. A sharp contrast to the small-scale physicality of the rest of the movie's horror. Confusing at best. I often try to exercise my personal hell to no avail, so now I show it in my films, said Fulci. But mind you, what is to me the most tragic thing in the house by the cemetery is not the people who die, but that little girl who opens for her young friend the gates to the world of the dead, and saves him from normality, but also plunges him into the beyond. In fact, those children do not actually die, they just live in another world in which adults have no power. Finally, the most frightening thing is that the house stays there and will receive other visitors. Like I said, films are dreams and horror films are specifically nightmares, holding you in their grip and making you subject to their whims, with only the credits bursting the balloon of their influence. Fulci's endings, unfortunately, often burst the balloon before the credits roll, undermining the strengths of what came before. Ultimately, these point toward the beyond as Fulci's strongest and most resonant. And it's no mistake why it became the one to find the most fame of the trilogy. All three Gates films would be released in Italy in the span of one year, and then released in the US several years later, bringing both solid financial success and an onslaught of critical backlash. International releases were censored, renamed, and sometimes banned causing their availability in each country to vary widely, and their reputations to grow in infamy. Italian horror has always had a strange reputation, and Fulci's movies are often at the center of the conversation, derided as rip-offs, often seen as nonsensical, and at the center of the video nasty controversy during the 80s and 90s. Movies like The Beyond were often pointed to as the cause of moral panic by those who hated horror while many horror fans saw them as trash. But Fulci always had his fans, and in the decades since, I think the Gates of Hell trilogy is a fascinating example of true skill and artistry in the execution of what many might see as lowbrow art. 
And these movies have gone on to influence everything from Resident Evil to Quentin Tarantino. There are obvious weaknesses in each of these films, and while they don't aspire to find mainstream cultural acceptance or critique modern social ills, they were dead set on finding what scares and unsettles audiences. And they found it. Decades later, and their fingers are still on the pulse of what scares us. Fulci would direct 10 more movies after the Gates trilogy finished, before passing away at the age of 68 in 1996. Long enough to see his trilogy find love from horror fans all around the world. And like those figures of evil at the center of each movie, that love will never truly die. Thanks for watching today's video and a quick return to horror in the new year. Lucio Fulci is such a strange and fascinating filmmaker, and you had to guess that eventually I would talk about some of his films on the channel. The Gates of Hell trilogy in particular are maybe his crowning achievement. Although Don't Torture a Duckling and of course Zombie 2 are also really high up on the list of his movies. And it is a very long list of movies. The dude made a lot. He worked all the time. And from everything that has been said, it was much to the detriment of his own personal life. But I really do enjoy the Gates of Hell movies. And the Beyond in particular, I think, is a classic horror movie. If you are at all interested in Italian horror or any sort of real supernatural horror, because it's really not a zombie movie, you absolutely have to at least check out The Beyond. Truly a movie for dang ass freaks. And of course, like I said, plots and logic and real sense is not the strong suit of those movies. Or most Fulci movies at all, really. But they are a great experience and I would absolutely love to watch them in a theater someday. So if there's ever a repertory theater out there that is showing the gates of hell, please let me know. Or maybe I could host it. That would be a lot of fun. Hosting repertory screenings of horror movies is a dream of mine. I first saw The Beyond as a teenager, and it really did freak me out. But I also don't think I really appreciated it. Because like I said, the plot and the characters and a lot of the acting are just not quite there. Over the years, I've rewatched all of these movies, and upon the most recent rewatch, I really, really had a good time. And while I do think that The House by the Cemetery is the weakest of the three, it's still a really entertaining neo-gothic film. And of course, like all Fulci movies, the gore is awesome. So if you're looking for that, it's all there. And of course, the guts puke in City of the Living Dead is an all-timer, and will absolutely be burned into the memory of anyone who has seen it at too young of an age. But hey, that's part of becoming a horror fan, right? Everyone's got that movie or two that they watched when they were way too young. For me, it was the original Evil Dead. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts about Lucio Fulci, the Gates of Hell trilogy, and Fulci movies overall. And of course, this is sort of a belated sequel to my Reza December Evil series, since I did talk a lot about Fulci's influence on the original RE and its remake. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. And if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video, as well as exclusive audio-only Patreon reviews. One of them being a review of Zombie 2 by Fulci, which I'm a big fan of. So I hope that this video inspired you to check out some of Fulci's movies if you never have, or to re-watch them again if it's been a little while. There's nothing else quite like them.